Hello, welcome to Chasm Words. My name is Sam and I'm so happy to see you here today. If you're a big Sarah J Mass fan though, you may not be happy to see me today. We're going to be talking about A Court of Silver Flames. Probably going to be my most disappointing read of the year. Right off the bat, I'm going to let you know I gave A Court of Silver Flames three stars and I consider that a very generous rating. I am always generous when it comes to Sarah J Mass books because she's one of my favorite authors. She has been for a long time. I have been reading her books since they've been coming out. I pre-ordered Throne of Glass all those years ago and I have not looked back. That series and all of her books have just been absolute favorites until A Court of Silver Flames. This, this is probably my least favorite of her books. And this video is to let you know why. Because I have a lot to say about it. I'm very little good to say about it. I think if I wasn't so invested in her books, in her worlds, in her characters, in her stories already. This book probably would have marked the end of my wanting to read her books or at least read this series. It was just that disappointing. It had so many story beats that I personally found very wrong and bad and just like horrible, some of them. So this is the video to talk about all of those and go in depth. I do have my notebook. It says Ledger of Perceived Slights. And this time I actually used that for slights that I perceived. <laughs> Alright, but here's the warning. This video is going to be full of spoilers. And when I say spoilers, I mean I'm going to be talking about everything. I mean, there will be so many spoilers. There's, yeah, I'm not gonna like stop myself from talking about it. I will also be talking about other books in the series, but I will not be spoiling anything to do with Throne of Glass or Crescent City. I'm saying that just because sometimes I do like to draw comparisons between authors' works, but I don't want to spoil those series if you're interested in reading them because both of those are really good and I, I still really like both of those series. What is A Court of Silver Flames about? Well, probably if you're watching this video you already know, but it is book four in the Court of Thorns and Roses series. It is the first technically adult book in that series, which was just fine, I guess. I think that was definitely a decision that was made and I think that it was, you know, employed to a pretty good degree in that there are a lot more sex scenes, but really that's the only thing marking it as more adult than the other books, which is a good reason to mark something as adult. I'm not saying it's like a bad reason. I'm just saying like I feel, and this isn't part of what I was going to talk about, but I feel like and you're moving into an adult sphere, you can start tackling some things in different ways. Like Nesta's past. I think you could tackle her alcoholism in a different way. I think you could tackle her trauma in a different way. I think you can tackle the other characters like Emma Ray and Gwyn, their trauma in a different way. This book did kind of feel like it was playing, uh, it was wearing gloves when it came to those kind of topics. Whereas it was full on ready to just embrace the sex and smut aspect of having an adult listing, which is fine. But I do think that if it had like gone all the way, because I think like Crescent City, which is an adult book, does kind of tackle those things in a much more nuanced and deep way that you see in adult books. But this one just kind of touched on them and played it safe. But I didn't actually make notes about that. I think that if I wanted to talk about that specifically, I would want to pull up exact references from the book. This is just like a sort of side note on the review. But it is the first adult book in the Court of Thorns and Roses series and it follows one of their side characters from the original trilogy, Nesta, and another side character, Cassian. This is their novel. They kind of uh, had a love-hate relationship in the second and third books, which I loved. It was so great to watch from the sidelines. And this one gives us up close and personal from them. It is also, unlike the other books in the series, told from third person point of view instead of first person point of view. I actually liked that change a lot. I think that having it from the third person point of view was a lot stronger than the first person point of view has been in the past. I also think it gave a little more texture to the voices. In the original trilogy, when we get first person point of views, it can be from either Farah or Resand. I believe his point of views are also first person, if I'm not misremembering. And in those cases, their voices just feel very similar. Whereas this one, I feel like the third person gives a lot more texture and nuance and just difference between Nesta and Cassian's voices. And we do only get Nesta and Cassian's voices. Wasn't sure going into this if we would get other people's, considering that like the little horrible little novella, I'm not counting that as like a book in the series because it's just really bad, has more Cassian, Nesta, Farah, Reese. I don't think we get any Asriel. So yeah, this one is just Cassian and Nesta and I liked that. I thought sticking to two characters was a good idea. Also maybe a bad idea. This book is about not just their relationship, but Nesta on a healing journey because the first 
The events of the third book have really put her in a horrible place. She's retreated to drinking, partying, spending a lot of money, living in squalor, and just not being a happy or nice person. Not that anyone has to be a nice person, but she's not even nice to herself. She's very much in a horrible place mentally and health-wise outside of mental health. And this book is her journey coming from that really dark place into a point of healing. And I'm going to talk so much about that because I have so many problems with it. Not that it happened, but like kind of how it happened. But I broke this review up into characters because I thought it would be easier to talk about the things I want to talk about in the context of the character they relate to. So some characters are going to have a lot and I'm going to start with them and some characters are not going to have that much. So they'll be at the very end. But I thought this was a nice way to organize my thoughts. So without further ado, we're going to start with Nesta, the star of our story. All right, first of all, Nesta, the things I liked or loved. I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I could like easily say I loved anything about this book, but there are things I liked. I liked Nesta making friends. Emery and Gwyn are great. I wasn't sure how I'd feel about either of them, but I really did like them. I liked their relationship with Nesta quite a bit. I liked that the three became friends, and I really liked the storyline of the three of them bonding, especially over books, which I totally get. That's something that I've definitely done with people in the past. I also really liked that their story really revolved, and this tied into them bonding over books, but really revolved around the three of them really reminding each other that their stories deserve to be told. I really liked that. I thought that was really important messaging. I thought that was really well done. I thought that it's something a lot of people, trauma in their lives, but specifically sexual trauma in their past, I think that it is worth telling people that their voice should be heard if they want to share, you know, and their story is worth being told and they're not a bad person. Like all of these great things. I think that that part of Nessa's storyline is really great. I think it is really lovely. I think that anchoring a large part of the plot in watching these women grow and help each other heal was really well done and is not something that we see a lot of. I think it's also really in line with the themes of the series considering that there is a lot of assault, especially towards our main characters. Resand is assaulted for years by Amarantha. Uh, Feyre is assaulted by Tamlin. You know, we have all of these themes of sexual assault and sexual, I guess, abuse, but I think I want to say more trauma, sexual trauma, like, for the characters, and it's a major part of the world. And I liked that we're finally getting a book really focused on healing from that, especially from a character who doesn't know if she deserves to be healed, because I think there are a lot of people out there who, regardless of what type of trauma it is, don't believe they deserve to be healed or deserve to really be loved in, in a normal way. So I did like that plot line. And like I said, I did also like Emery and Gwyn. I wish we could have gotten even more from the other priestesses, but you know what? It's okay. Definitely room for more storytelling there. So I'm not really complaining. I just like, it was like a, that would have been nice, but not like a mark against the book. Speaking of friends, the sentient house. I love sentient houses. It's one of my favorite tropes in fantasy. If there's a sentient house in a book, I probably love the book. No, I shouldn't say that because this book already disproves that. But if there's a sentient house in a book, I probably love the house because I really love the concept of sentient houses. So yes, I, I loved that part of this story. I thought that was great. I liked that the house had some trauma and darkness that it was willing to share with Nesta. I liked that it was a really good, good character. <laughs> I, without any dialogue, I thought it had a lot of personality. So I thought that was cool. Scene-wise, I thought there were only two good scenes with Nesta. And I kind of want to extrapolate on what I mean. I think there were only two good scenes that not only put her center in both her plot and the wider plot of the story, but also that were just really well written and engaging and made me forget the things about the book I disliked. These were two scenes that pulled me back into the story and made me remember why I love Sarah J. Mass's books and writing and why I love this series. There are other really good scenes with Nesta, but while reading those scenes, I just wasn't as engaged for some reason or another, or I thought it wasn't really connecting to the wider story as well as Nesta's personal plotline. So, for example, while I did enjoy the trial, whoa, what is it called? While I did really enjoy the blood right stuff, I wasn't super engaged the entire time. I was like, yes, this is interesting, but I don't know, there's other things happening and Nesta is very alienated from those things. But the two scenes that I did really like, the scene in the swamp and the scene in the prison. These are the two scenes where she goes on this like fetch quest to find uh, the things. One of them, 
on purpose. The other one she doesn't realize she's like going into the lake to grab it but still I really liked that. I thought it not only connected her to the wider plot of Brienne and this new war and finding these new weapons but it also really connected to her growing, her coming into her power, her coming into herself, her realizing you know that she had something to fight for, something to lose, and that really has to do with her and Cassian more than anything else, but still that is like the heart of the story is their relationship. And these scenes were so good. I think when I got to the prison scene I was like okay finally the book is turning up. It's going to be what I remember, what I love reading in Sarah J Mass books. It is going to be so good. Like I'm gonna like it's going to keep going. It's gonna be great. I, I'll have reason to forgive all these past things that happen, or if not forgive, think upon them a little softer. But no, as soon as the prison scene ended, and I was kind of like, oh, well, we're back to all these things I hate. So these were kind of like little oasises in the book of moments that I loved. And yeah, they were both pretty badass. Let's be honest, both pretty badass. I've already seen some fan art of the swamp scene of Nesta raising the dead and that was so cool and severely underused considering she doesn't have her powers anymore. Speaking of powers, I thought her powers were pretty cool. I don't think that we got much of an understanding of what they are still. Like I have no idea exactly what her powers are except that it's like power over death and that she can forge new like crazy powerful weapons. But I thought those were really cool. I thought that especially the forging of weapons and being able to put like her, basically her essence into these things. I thought that was really neat. I thought that was a power that I, really would have loved to see more of. Yeah, maybe like a character based around that. Maybe not in this book, maybe not even by Sarah J Mass, but I think it's just a really cool concept. Real quick backtracking to the blood riot, since I did mention it already, I really liked that Emery and Gwyn made it to the top of the peak to complete the blood riot, but Nesta didn't. I thought that was a really, really great character beat. She is very clearly putting others before herself. I mean, obviously she's protecting them, but in a very physical sense. They're above her. They're not like better than her, but they're above her. They're further than her. They've made it to a point. She'll, she'll never make it to that point, but she still made it to a very important and worthwhile point on this journey. So they're all awarded these like these honors of completing the blood rite in such a important way, I guess. And I liked that Nesta wasn't like the end all be all best of the best. I liked that she let her friends be that, but she didn't have to be, to still be a victor. I liked that messaging. I liked the layout of that moment. I just liked it. And the last good thing, some of the sex scenes were okay. I thought that the latter half of the sex scenes were really good. I thought the first however many, like basically the first half of the sex scenes, I was like, wow, this is not doing anything for me and it's kind of boring. But definitely they get a lot better in the second half of the novel. So kudos for that. I thought they were really good. All right, now the bad. I think worst is that Nesta really wasn't part of the plot. So she has her own character arc and journey. And that's the whole like Valkyrie and healing storyline. But there is a wider plot happening that the characters talk about a lot. You know, Cassian is involved in it directly. Nesta has like a few small scenes such as like the swamp or the prison or when she goes and meets with Eris. But she's really not a part of the plot. She's just used as like a tool by the other characters to find these weapons. Otherwise doesn't have really a personal connection to what's going on. Like the book tries to make it that she does. Like, oh, Breolin hates Nesta and you know, Nesta cares about her family and therefore doesn't want to see them all killed and also hates Breolin. But I don't know, she, it, it wasn't that compelling of a reason for her to be involved, right? And Cassian and Cassian will be off doing his own thing. He'll be part of this bigger plot of like Koshi and what's going on with Brillin and war on the other continent and making sure there's peace and even like Tamlin is like low-key a part of all this because he's like having his panic attack thing. No that's not fair but he's like broken down himself into this beast and he just the fact that he's not a strong leader is a threat to the rest of the continent continent? I guess it's an island. You know, it's a threat to them. So even he's more into the main story, like the big plot, than Nesta is. And I thought this was really strange. She was off and off doing her own thing and just not involved, not invested, and therefore it was very hard for the reader, me, to be invested in this bigger plot. I was like, oh, we just finished a war, but Nesta really doesn't seem to care too much. She's not doing anything that's directly related. Why would I care too much? It was really strange. It was really strange. I really disliked it. 
I think it took a lot of power away from Nesta because it's just her healing. And while yes, everyone deserves a space to heal and should be able to heal on their own, sometimes you can't do that in a vacuum, especially in the position that Nesta is in. Her spending so much time in a vacuum is very strange. If this was the first book in a series, I would kind of get it a lot more, but it's not. This is her only book. So in her only book, rather than make her sort of a central figure in this much larger plot, she's just sidelined. A sidelined protagonist who doesn't seem to think at all about it. <laughs> I really disliked that. Another thing that really weakened the plot and I think tied into Nesta not being directly involved in this bigger plot is that the story was set in a familiar place surrounded by familiar characters. That makes the stakes so soft. It destroys a lot of tension in the book because you're in a familiar place so there's really not that much world building to do first of all second of all you're not really I don't say worried about the place but you're not worried about the place necessarily because we've already seen some havoc come to Valeris you know we've we've already seen these places we've seen the threats they pose and the threats they don't pose so there's nothing new there being surrounded by familiar characters is exactly the same thing I know Farah and Reese were kind of in a bind and Farah, yes, was threatened by her pregnancy, but I wasn't actually afraid that they were going to die. I wasn't afraid that anyone that we were familiar with was going to die. I think the only one that might have been any danger would have been Azurella Cassian, but even then I was like, yeah, no, there's no way. They're going to be fine. Everyone's going to be fine because we've already seen them go through all these horrible trials. So what? We're going to kill them now after the main trilogy? Like, with all this buildup, suddenly we have no buildup and we're just going to, they're dead? Yeah, I don't think so. As a reader, as a writer, it would make no sense. And it, 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 of course it didn't happen. Of course no one was in jeopardy. I really think Nesta's story, at least part of it, should have taken place outside of familiar territory, outside of familiar characters. I think that would have been smart. I think it would have raised the tension, the stakes. It would have made us worry about new characters. We had no concern. And being surrounded by familiar characters allowed Nesta to really play this sidelined role and be okay with it because you have characters like Azrael who's off spying, more who's off on a different continent, Farah and Reese doing their thing, Amran doing her thing, you know we had all these characters doing their thing, taking care of the big picture stuff and Nesta didn't have to. She had her little side quest, the fetch quest, and that sort of tied into the big stuff but also really didn't for most of the book so. I really think it was a mistake having it set in a familiar place. It was also incredibly boring to have it set in a familiar place because like I said, lack of world building, not much to build if you've already built it up. The sentient house was a nice touch, but other than that, we didn't really get to see that much more of the world. And one of my favorite things, especially in book three, is the world building that we get when we meet all the High Lords and stuff. So yeah, really disappointed. I keep saying it's a fetch quest. Uh, and it is. It's another fetch quest. The same role that Nesta played in book three, Finding the Cauldron, is the exact role she is playing in book four, her book. She's doing nothing new and exciting. She has to find the god, I've already forgotten what they are. The MacGuffins were all kind of stupid. Um, it was a crown, which Brielin already had. A, a mask, which allowed her to command the dead, I think is what it did. And then the harp. And the harp was cool. Side note, and I didn't mention it in things I loved, but I did love that we finally got on-page confirmation of the multi-world theory that we've, as fans, been working off of for a long time. However, that had very little to do with the plot. So as nice as it was, it was just kind of an Easter egg, and as much as I liked it, it really didn't move the plot forward. And neither did Nesta's fetch quest. Not really. She finds the three MacGuffins, or two of them at least, and hurrah! Yay! New powerful weapons. I guess this is the exact same thing we saw in Akawar. So that was really boring and uninteresting. Give Ka give Nesta something interesting to do, please. Nesta losing her magic at the end of the book does not equal character growth, okay? She kind of hated what she had taken, but also she had taken this thing from the cauldron as an act of defiance. Her story is about healing. It is about growing close with her family and appreciating what she has to a degree, but it's about healing. Taking from her a thing that made her feel powerful in a moment when she wasn't powerful feels very counterintuitive. I also thought it was stupid because there was so much more we could have done with Nesta's power and also it was a very silly moment to have it be taken. I'm still not sure how the correlation worked between her giving up her powers and Farah living. 
they weren't healing powers. Like, what was going on there? I don't know. It was really strange. I thought it was a silly decision. I thought it was a strange decision. And I thought it was a disappointing decision. Because, like I said, we really didn't know what Nesta's power was. And now they're gone. So we'll never know. So who cares, I guess. Who cares? <laughs> and last up for the list of Nesta things I hated. I hated that her and Cassian were mates. I think mates are cute. I think it's a nice touch. Feyre and Rhysand are mates, and I think that's really nice. I think that's really important and powerful. But not every relationship has to center around mates is the thing. Because is it not just as powerful to fall in love with someone outside of the fact that you're destined for each other? I mean, in the books, we know even that sometimes mates don't work out. Sometimes they're fated to be together, and it's not great. Like, Rhysand, mother and father had a not great relationship. He was not a good person, but he was mated to this woman. Didn't really work out. So why did Nesta and Cassian have to be mates? Why can their love and relationship not be strong and powerful enough without that aspect? It can still be true love without the destined to be together part, is all I'm saying. And I thought it was stupid that they're mates. I thought it was stupid that they're mates and kind of disappointing that, you know, the one characters who, or the two characters who up until this point we really didn't see anything to indicate that they were mates, suddenly they are just like, it felt like a plot contrivance. It felt unneeded. It felt unneeded. 100%. Next character we're talking about is Cassian. Things I liked about Cassian. Genuinely, I do like Cassian. I think he's a good character. I think out of all the characters in this book, he's the only one who seemed to be making consistently rational decisions and in-character decisions. I think Nesta did too, I'll, I'll be honest. But out of all the inner circle characters, I'll say, he was the only one who seemed to be consistent to his character in the previous books. And I do really like Cassian. He's very noble and roguish at the same time. So great balance there. Okay, so things I didn't like about Cassian. Wow, that was fast. Hmm. And you know, this is why. I don't have much to say about Cassian because he doesn't really have a plot. He's part of the plot. You know, he goes, he is sort of being like a courier, but also not really. And he is sort of helping Azrael, but also not really. And he's helping Nesta train. I guess that's his plot, but his personal character arc? Nope. No, there wasn't one. There wasn't one. <laughs> nope. I don't even know what it was supposed to be because there just wasn't one. He did things on the page, but he wasn't going anywhere. He just did things on the page. He felt like a supporting character being given point of view scenes, but without any plot. <laughs> there was no character arc for Cassian. He did not go anywhere. And there was definitely room for him to have a character arc. You know, we set up at the very beginning, pretty much, like he's put all these monsters away in the prison. He's got his own personal demons that he's always dealing with, but then that goes nowhere because he's been alive for a very long time and he's kind of dealt with all his personal demons. Yep, no plot for Cassian. Sorry. There's a moment of angst where he's being like mind controlled by Braylon and the crown at the very end. And it didn't last long enough. Okay, it didn't last long enough. Yes, I am a big fan of angst and I love seeing these things dragged out. But more than that, the tension of the scene, it, it lasted like maybe two chapters. He breaks out of it very quickly slash tries to kill himself very quickly into this and I was just like there's no tension if if it only lasts for a chapter and a half like how scary but cool would it have been if he ended the book still being mind controlled like that sets up so much moving forward it would have been a strange decision but it, it still it sets up so much but no no it lasted for a chapter and a half any tension that could have been built up was destroyed almost immediately because it was resolved almost immediately so again Cassian has no plot. And the one moment where he almost got to be integral into his own possible plot, because that's another moment you could have set up, you know, something for him, some sort of character arc, even though it comes really late in the story, it still could have, it still could have been a plot. Uh, yeah. No. Done. Right away. Don't want to stick around with that. This book is full of happy endings. How boring. All right, character three, Feyre. I don't love pregnancy plot lines. That's just a personal thing. I think they, they're fine. I think they can be done really well. I think they can be done poorly. I just don't really vibe with them. They're not something I'm interested in reading about too much. But I did really like how it worked in the story and that it took Thera out of being a main character in a very natural way. Of course she's not going to insert herself when she is risking not just her life but her unborn child and Rhysand, which is a stupid little thing, but you know. I liked that. I thought that was a really natural and smart way to take her out of being the protagonist and allow Nesta to be the protagonist, even though it doesn't really allow Nesta to be the protagonist because 
Nesta doesn't really do anything with the plot, but I did. I like that. I thought it worked really well. I thought it was a smart decision. And I also think, you know, it was a smart decision because it sidelined her character while still giving her character a lot of dignity to be sidelined. It was clearly her decision and it was a good decision, I guess. Now the things I didn't like about Feyre, <laughs> as you can see, there's mostly things I don't like about these characters. What line? Um, so we're seriously going to almost kill her again after giving us a trilogy of her struggling and like almost being killed and being in peril we're gonna like almost kill her in childbirth. First of all I hate the trope. There are so many epic fantasy books where the mother or the woman you know the wife dies in childbirth. I mean look at Game of Thrones. I think there was a really famous blog for a while that was like the dead mothers of Westeros or something and it's a horrible trope and I hate it. It happens in almost every epic fantasy. And you're gonna kill Farrah in childbirth or even pretend to. Like I hate that. I hate that it's feeding into the trope. Yes, by feeding into the trope and like nearly doing it by not doing it. Yes, I guess it's a little bit sort of reversal of fates, but also not really. Like we didn't have to do this. It also would have been just as great for her to have had a healthy pregnancy and birth. Why not, right? Like I said, it also, like I wasn't worried about her character. I knew she'd be fine because there's no tension in this story. And yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that part. But really? We're doing this again? I think another negative of the pregnancy aspect of the plot is that the story felt like it had to fit into the length of Farrah's pregnancy. It starts off near the beginning and ends as she's giving birth, more or less. That's a really long time period and the book felt like it had been stretched to cover that time period. There would be times where it would jump and it'd be like a month later and I was like, what? There are other books that have done similar things that Sarah J Mass have written. Let's talk about the first Throne of Glass book. I'm not going to spoil anything because I said I wouldn't, but there's a lot of training in that book and a lot of time does pass, but it feels very natural. Even when there's like a time jump, it'll be like, okay, another, after a week of continuous training or whatever, like it'll have a line like this. A Court of Silver Flames will have a line that's like, a month later and they were ready for the ball. And I was like, this much time did not need to be passing. This kind of builds into my own personal pet peeve that I think pacing is really important in story and I don't think it's something that we talk about a lot, but pacing is super important, especially when it comes to real world time passing. The pacing of this book was fucked up because it had to fit into the length of Farrah's pregnancy. If it didn't have to fit into that length, I think it would have had a really strong pace. I think it would have made a lot more sense in a lot of ways. I think that the long pacing also helped kill tension. There were so many things in this book that just destroyed any tension that the story might have had. And the length of time, like it covers several months, but on page, it doesn't feel like it's several months necessarily. The characters don't feel like they're making those leaps and bounds. The tension being stretched out that long, it makes it feel like the events, they're like, we have to do this now. It feels like, no, actually you didn't because you have months and nothing has happened. And it's just silly to stretch out a story. If you can make it shorter and tighter, I personally always prefer that. And I think it always makes a stronger story if you can tighten it up. And finally, the way she kind of forced Nesta into her like healing, I guess. I get it. I, I, I kind of come at this at two minds. So at the beginning of the novel, Nesta basically gives Feyre, reverse that, Feyre basically gives Nesta the ultimatum. Go to the House of the Wind, train with Cassian, work in the library, or leave. Go to the human realms, you'll be exiled. And this is to get Nesta out of a really toxic point in her life. And I do understand that. I understand that that is sort of what you have to do for people you love who won't pull themselves out of situations like this. I do understand that. At the same time, Farah really hadn't done anything for Nesta prior to this to help her with the situation. She sort of was of the mindset that Nesta will get herself out of the situation or she won't. And she was like, Nesta can heal on her own. And other than sort of offering a handout and being like, yes, you know, I'm your sister, I'm here for you. She really didn't do anything active. And I'm not saying it's Farah's responsibility to do that, but I think if you're not doing that and then suddenly you drop this ultimatum on someone, I think that is very unkind. I think that there's something kind of toxic about that too because Nesta is clearly in a position where she's doing these things acting out because it gives her power over her life and Farah is disregarding that completely and taking away all that power and that can have negative consequences as well and the book doesn't even really consider those. So I'm kind of two minds on that but I didn't like it. I thought there were smarter ways to do it. I think even if Farah had just tried a little differently prior to that to try to help Nesta if maybe it had seen a more consistent healing or attempt at healing her plotline prior to rather than just continuously giving her money and feeding her habits. I think 
then I wouldn't have been as disappointed in Farrah's decision to give her this ultimatum, but as it stands, we didn't have that, so I was disappointed. Right, the fourth character we're going to talk about, I wasn't numbering before this, but uh, we are now, is Resand. Things I liked about Resand. Nothing. There is nothing I liked about Resand in this book. There are really two reasons I hated Resand. One of them is his fault. The other one, um, I think is the fault of the author, I guess. That is to say, I don't think it's like anyone in the universe's fault, more as it's just a plot point that I hate that it was even brought up. And that is the concept of like a high king of the, of Prithian. And everyone's like, Reese, you should do it. And Reese is like, no way. And I'm like, Reese and thank God you said no. But even the fact that it's being raised and you're being put in a position where everyone's like, yeah, you should do it, buddy. I hate that. I hate that so much. I, I love Resand in the original trilogy. But even then, I would hate that. He, I don't know if I can elaborate on why I hate that so much as I hate the concept of one of these characters having that much power over everyone else. It seems like a bad idea. It seems stupid to have like a high king. Like really? We need more monarchies? No, I don't think so. Let's get like a Democrat, a, a, so, a democratic socialist leader in there. Okay, but like, I hate it. I hate that it was even brought up. I'm glad it didn't happen. I'm fairly certain it's going to happen. Why well, bring it up if it's not going to happen in a later book? But I think it's stupid and I really hate that that's where the plot is going with him and his character. Ridiculous. He doesn't deserve it. Sorry. And uh, most egregious, and this is Rhysand's fault, the fact that he fucking keeps the threat of the pregnancy from Farah, like it could kill her and he's like, no one tell her, is so rage inducing. It's her body, it's her right to know. It was her decision, you know, up until this point. Like, it's not attractive. It's awful that he did this. He kept it from her for months. Everyone around her knew. And then when Nesta spills the beans, people are pissed at her. I mean, Farah was like, yeah, I'm glad you told me, but everyone else was like, Nesta, what the hell? Why would you tell her? It's like, are you kidding? You should have told her right away. And the fact that you didn't is incredibly disturbing. And the fact that you didn't, and you're all like, yeah, no, listen to Resand, even more disturbing. I hated it completely changed my view on the character. I don't know if I'll be able to read him the same way in the original trilogy if I ever reread it, which, I mean, it's debatable if I ever will at this point because I really hated this book. I hated it. I thought it was a despicable, awful character decision. And the way it was treated, it was not treated as a despicable, awful character decision. It was treated as, yeah, that's just like a protective thing he does. Like, no, that's not okay. That's really not okay. That is not treating your partner, your mate, with respect. That is not giving her consent in the situation. I don't really know how abortion works in Prithian. I don't even know if that's something she would want to consider. But yeah, you kind of took that power away from her as well. So really not okay with it. And really not okay with how the characters reacted to it because they were all okay with it. That's not cool. No, that's not cool. Okay, character five, Azrael. Yeah, there's really nothing to say about Azrael. I didn't read his point of view chapter. I've heard some things about it. Seems like he's kind of scummy in it, but um, I haven't read it, so I can't speak for it myself. Yeah, he's like Cassian. He didn't really have a plot. I didn't put Elaine on this list. I totally forgot to include her. Uh, she really doesn't do much. She's really a background, background character. I feel the same about Elaine as I did before. I don't hate her. I know a lot of people hate her. I think she's okay, and I still think she's okay. I am looking forward to her book. I think it'll be interesting, but uh, she's just okay. Congrats, Elaine. You've managed to plateau. Characters number six. Lucian, Jurian, and Vasa. The same as Ezreal and Cassie, and they really didn't do much in the book. The only thing is I wish there had been more of them, specifically Lucian, because I love him and we deserved more scenes with him. Also, they're really interesting characters, the three of them, and we really only get one scene with the three of them, but it's an interesting dynamic. It's interesting characters. I feel like there's a lot of storylines that could branch off of them. I really thought they'd be more important considering how much setup there is at the end of Akawar for them, especially Vasa. I mean, Vasa is directly connected to Koshi and... Um, yeah, that didn't seem to matter much in this book. Because, probably because Nest is just not a part of that plot. But, yeah. Wish there had been more. I think it was disappointing that there wasn't. I think if you wanted to put characters who are familiar to the reader, but not necessarily ones that are so familiar that you're not worried about them, I think Lucian, Vasa, and Jurian were the three that you should have used. Character number seven is Eris. I, I liked Eris. He, surprisingly, he was probably the standout character for me in this book. He's not a good person. He's a dick, but he kind of owns it and he's a nuanced dick and I appreciated that. I think he's a really interesting new character to watch. I can't wait to see what happens with him. He's definitely got a lot more beneath the surface. I don't know if I want a redemption arc for him. I don't know if it matters if he has a redemption arc. I think him saying 
staying firmly as an asshole is pretty good. I think it's just as interesting to have characters that you hate but you don't hate as much as other characters and you like but you don't like as much as other characters. I think that's kind of cool. And yeah, I really liked Eris. I thought he was a kind of a bright spot in this disappointing book and just that he was new and different and a little bit of a wild card, whereas no one else really was. Character number eight, Amarin. The good about Amarin. For some reason I liked her more in this book than I did in the other books, maybe because she just takes up less page time. I don't, I'm not a big Amarin fan. I think she's okay. I think she's fine. I've, she's never been someone I've been particularly drawn to, but she's okay, right? Um, what I didn't like about Amarin in this book. She's definitely entitled to her own opinions and emotional responses, and she does not have to be Nesta's friend. However, I don't think Nesta deserved the way she treated her. Nesta was not a bad spot, and Amarin definitely can lash out. That's fine. I don't, I don't really mind that. I think that's fine that they kind of had like a friendship breakup. And Nesta was being a bit of a brat about it. But at the same time, she was being a very vulnerable brat about it. Like she definitely saw Amarin as choosing her sister over her. And while that's completely irrational, and Amarin could have been like, Nesta, that's irrational. That's not how it works. Amarin just kind of let the relationship poison as much as Nesta did. I get that that's totally in character. I just thought it was sort of disappointing in the fact that Nesta then has to like get on her knees and basically beg for forgiveness. Really uncomfortable. Really didn't like that. I don't think that should have happened. You know, um, that's not a healing moment for Nesta. That's, I, don't, I guess it could be a healing moment, but it really just showed us her being ashamed. And that is important, right? Especially from where Nesta is coming from. But there didn't seem to be any character awareness that maybe Amarin had sort of stepped out of line to. She sort of gave up on Nesta. Really the only person who didn't give up on Nesta was Cassian. And Amarin was kind of her friend. Like that's a shitty thing to do. I wouldn't want to be friends with someone who was willing to give up on me because they just kind of thought I was being out of line and then like needs you to like beg for forgiveness too. I don't know. I, there just seems like a power imbalance there I guess is what I'm trying to say and made me uncomfortable didn't like that. Definitely could have been played differently and I would have liked that, but I think the way that it did play out wasn't a fan. Character number nine, Moore. She was off doing her own thing in this book and that was for the best. Good for Moore. Stay out of it, babe. That's all I have to say. And number 10, the villains. There's nothing I liked about them. Uh, we have Braylon and Koshi. Neither of them has much character. Neither of them seems much of a threat. Koshi a little bit, but also not really. And Brielin, yeah, I wasn't threatened by her at all. Like, I guess she has a personal tie to Nesta, but also not really. She was boring. Their goals were pretty much the same as Amarantha's and um, the King of Hybern. <laughs> like, world domination. Okay, again, we're doing this again. How boring. Koshi, I think, could be interesting because he's like a death lord or whatever, but they didn't do anything really with that with this book because the focus was on Brielin and she was boring and had no personality, and we didn't get to really know what her, like, why her motives were, what they were. It was just, like, she wants to kill Nesta, I guess, because she hates her. I guess. Like, okay, you don't have any other goals in your life? No? Sounds good. That's not how people work. Disappointed by the villains. <laughs> they also felt very tacked on. Koshi less so, but Breelin surprisingly more so. She's a character who existed at least in some capacity in the original trilogy and I easily could see the human queens being a villain in this series. Like that makes sense. It makes, it's a, it's a nice leap and connecting and a bridge. It's a nice bridge between the original trilogy and this new series. But yeah, no, it, it, it didn't work. She felt tacked on. It was like, ah, yes, of course, this is a villain. Same with Koshi. It was like, I guess you were mentioned before, but you feel really tacked on just so we can have a big bad. And speaking of tacked on things, yeah, the new like MacGuffins felt very tacked on. There was trying to be an explanation in the book like, oh, you know, there's a spell so that we don't remember them. Like, wow, how boring. Do something interesting, please. Yeah, so that's uh, maybe my very harsh review of this book, but I really just liked it. Super disappointing. How would I change it? Um, I've kind of talked about that and maybe it's weird to throw this into a review, but I have thought about like small changes or big changes even, but changes that I think you could add to the story or change about the story without changing a lot of the story and it would be that much better. First of all, I think the setting, like I said, don't put it somewhere familiar. There's the point where Nesta and Cassian go on their hike. I think more scenes like that that really got Nesta out of a familiar territory. I think even if you just had her, you know, set somewhere else. If you, maybe she chose 
she wanted to be exiled to the human lands and then finds out wait there's something happening on the other continent I'm gonna go deal with this for personal reasons Cassian maybe because he is playing courtier gets sent over there we can still get some healing we can still I don't know somehow connect Nesta having friends it would have to be very different but I think just changing the setting would have been so very helpful it also would have gotten her out of familiar characters arm's length and would have given Nesta's decision making a lot more agency rather than just being told oh go find the mask go find the harp it would have been Nesta choosing to do these things for whatever reasons her reasons work rather than just being told do this thing if you're not going to do that um and you still want to keep the fetch quest tie it into her healing make I think that to some degree it was you know the moments in the swamp and the moments in the prison were tied into her growth of relationship with Cassian which is important for her healing but you can tie it in even more maybe there is you know maybe she does the blood right and it's not even supposed to be part of this fetch quest but as she's like doing it she finds the harp you know maybe it's it's there and you tie it in together so you have the healing the moments of the blood right but you also have the fetch quest thrown in combine more of these sorts of things together tie it in directly to Nesta tie the two plots in tighter together because they're so alienated from each other most of the story I think that really would have strengthened it I think it's something that Sarah J Mass has done in the past in books but just for whatever reason did not do it in this book maybe this is weird but I think Asriel should have been mind controlled the entire book or most of it how much tension would it have built if you find out in the final act that Azrael has not actually been Azrael but has been under the control of the crown the entire time? This would have tied into my thoughts for Cassian, which is to give him a character arc and make him make hard decisions in regards to his friends. Imagine Cassian having to face down Azrael, who's been mind controlled, finding out that his best friend, his brother, has been betraying him this entire time without meaning to. Cassian is then put in a position where he has to make hard decisions whatever those decisions are he still has to make them he has to deal with them it gives Cassian a lot more to do it gives him a character arc it gives him actual tension it gives a story actual tension and it makes things a lot more interesting so yes make Azrael mind controlled the entire time please and thank you get rid of the mate plot line I hate it I don't think we needed it I think it actually detracted from Cassian and Nesta's relationship because it's showing that you know they're destined to be together that's why it's not because Cassian is the only one who hasn't given up on her. It's he's the only one who hasn't given up on her because she's his mate. Like, really? No, I hate that. I know that's not exactly what the novel is saying, but also at the same time, it kind of is. Like, can we get rid of the mate plot point, please? We don't need it in every relationship. It's not hot anymore. And finally, actually deal with Nesta's alcoholism. I don't know if it's like in-world or even out-of-world context if we know this, but can the Fae get, like... Can they get addicted to things? Can they have alcoholism? I, I don't think that it has been said that they can't. Nesta does a lot of drinking. She's been putting herself in really bad positions, but she doesn't suffer like withdrawals or anything. She's just like, okay, away from alcohol. She misses it, but I don't know. There's not real consequence there. I think that there should have been. I think that that's an important aspect of healing, especially in the real world. If you're in a bad position and you go out drinking every night, you're an alcoholic. Like that's what that is, you know? So the fact that that's not really dealt with at all really disliked that thought that was kind of tacky that it wasn't uh, it was ignored completely i think the book would have gone a lot better if that was just dealt with and not ignored because it's a serious thing and it shouldn't be anything other than dealt with in a serious manner that's it that's my review no hate to the author i still love sarah j mass still love her books i just don't like this one that much i still like the characters i guess in general except resand because what the fuck but uh Yes, I will read the next book in the series. I will. I know I will, but I have such low expectations for it. Anyway, thank you for watching the review. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Please, let's talk about it. I want to talk about it. People who loved it, tell me why you loved it. I wish I had loved it. I just didn't. People, if you had other, if you had other things that you hated about this and I didn't talk about, let me know that too, because I'd love to like see where we all kind of like fall on the how did we feel about the book, but. Yeah, that's it for me. Definitely go check out my reading vlog for this because that was kind of a lot of fun and you get to watch me be like super excited and then get to the very end where I'm like, that's it? That was the novel we got? So yeah, go check that out. It's a lot of fun and I will see you guys soon. Bye!